discuss this together. Okay, got it. So, um, so um, as uh, Matt said, I'm a, a pediatric neuropsychologist. This is one of my second hats. I was originally an adolescent and family therapist and did my training in that before. Um, and I was all, became very interested in, in, in just how, how differently people took in the messages that we, we talked about. And, um, and that's where, that's sort of how I started getting into the neuropsychology psychology and the whole idea of the different perspectives of different learning styles and how that, how that fits with emotional styles as well. Um, I think um, the other thing that, that I realized when I was doing this is that my very, very, in the midst of time, my original um, uh, master's degree was at the School of Education in, at Boston University. And at that time, it was with uh, Ralph Mosier. And we were doing a lot of stuff around moral development with Ralph Kohlberg's theories. And the whole developmental perspective was one that was really sort of the way that my whole career kind of started out. And it's been very interesting in sort of looking at the sort of social emotional issue and around friendship, because I want to talk a lot about friendship and how that has a lot of these pieces, how your pieces sort of come back into life again about in terms of the, the ways that we, our, our perspective sort of broadens as we become older and more, have more sophisticated tools to deal with it. So I think just to sort of start out um, with, you also just to sort of put up with my sort of, oh, there we go. All right. So um, I think the first thing to talk about really is the, the three things we're going to talk about today is one is sort of the concept of human development and sort of how that all works. Um, so it's a dynamic and interactional process. The second thing we're going to talk about is really is what I call the laboratory of childhood social development, and that's friendship. Um, uh, and, <clears throat> and the third is really talking a little bit of how to assess a little bit about where kids are having trouble. And then the intervention part, I'm gonna leave kind of open. I think we can have an open discussion to that. And I think the questions that will come in will help sort of uh, direct where we're gonna go with that one. So, um, so uh, development sort of the process of becoming. And I think, I think of it, I think when I was, at one point I described myself as a biopsychosocial constructivist pulling together all the different pieces. I think that's a big word, but it's basically the idea that we're not, it's not nature or nurture. It's an interaction between a, a three, what I call three different factors. One is sort of a hardwired aspect of us that our body, we are physiologically and neurologically, we're hardwired to have certain processes come through at certain times that the emergence and refinement of brain and body systems. We have a general map for development. Um, and I think that's, that's there and that's, that's sort of built in. And it happens, you know, for an example is speech, is language. You know, kids typically begin to <clears throat> start having one or two words sometime between 12 and 18 months, and they begin to have sentences around two years. So we know that's the best sort of the hardwired built in. And so we, it's one of the reasons we can say if a kid, if a kid isn't, hasn't sort of hit those kind of milestones by those ages, then we begin to kind of worry a little bit and think about intervention. The second piece that sort of fits into this is sort of the unique constellation of who the child is. That's sort of the, the learning, temperament, emotional, the other, the, the unique, uh, you know, the learning style, basically. And the, you know, this could include things either from a learning disability, it could include um, autism, it could include um, a, a, a sort of proclivity or vulnerability to anxiety. Um, but those are kinds of things that are sort of built in as well for the individual. And then the third piece that I think is really important. I call them the environmental factors. And this is really a really big, big basket. And this is really, it's relational, it's like attachment. Do we have a, a, a you know, do we have a history of, a, of attachment figures? People who are consistently and reliably there for us. So that allows us to have the freedom to, to really experiment and play and, and engage in sort of in, in, in learning about the world. Um, it's physical. Or do we live in a safe environment? And is it okay to walk outside our door without being worried about being shot? Um, is it a, a place where there's a lot of toxins? You know, do we live next to a super highway where there's lead floating around all the place? That was, you know, that's one of the reasons we had the whole, the whole lead-free um, gasoline kind of thing, because it was having a tremendous impact on people, poor people who live near uh, uh, super highways. Um, uh, another is the the sort of the the, um, the our sort of social the, our resources and challenges, and I think of that of sort of like what are the resources that that we we have in our lives? Do we have uh, do we have access to food? Do we have access to safe housing? Do we have access to um, 
to, to books and to education and, and intellectual stimulation. Those are all factors that are, are really important. And this, the, the, the sort of the interweaving of these three things, you know, what we sort of, the, sort of our general roadmap of who we have and unique individual pieces that we take and the environmental factors that bring in really sort of influence how, how we get through the world and how, and what our, uh, and how we sort of hit these different milestones and the resources and challenges that we have in doing this. So, you know, if you think, it, I mean, that's not so hard to think about. If you think about, you know, some kids are more vulnerable than others, but they're vulnerable for different reasons. You know, the kid, the sort of slow, slow to warm up kid, the kid who's a little more cautious and, and shy is going to have um, experienced the world in a different way than a person who has, you know, a profile of not kind of getting the whole social piece, having difficulty with perspective taking and being kind of more of a rigid thinker. Now, both of those kids are vulnerable, but they're vulnerable for different reasons. And the, inf the uh, interplay of those environmental factors can have a tremendous impact on how, how their, their social emotional well-being and development. Um, I think the other piece, though, is when a kid does have, is sort of off the map, more off the the beaten path, then sometimes the beaten path seems really, really narrow. You know, if they have some kind of more unique, uh, you know, learning disability or, or emotional uh, uh, vulnerability, those kids, because it's harder for them to sort of make it through these various pieces, they tend to be a little more delayed in social uh, in social and emotional development. And I think that's really, really important for people to understand, because I think I'm going to talk next about what are our expectations of kids typically get through things, but I want you to also think about the fact, well, if you've got other challenges that you're dealing with, you may not be making it on, on, on the same, having the same sort of calendar that everybody else has. And I think even before I go into that, the one thing I, I really want to talk about, just mention before we go into this, is that um, we're going to talk about social development and, and friendships and, and how to help kids get through that. But there's lots of different, even though you know, we are all hardwired to be social in some ways. What that means for each of us is really different. And it can, you know, what's important is being able to have a friend. You don't have to have a million friends. You don't have to be able to, be, to perform in groups, but, you know, just so that you are able to do, have that that access to the, the uh, intimacy and mutuality that's so important in our own development and our own, our own well-being. Okay. So... Now what I want to talk a little bit is about friendship. And I thought, I kind of got into this. We were talking about social social challenges, but I was thinking, well, what, really, what's it all about? Well, it's about friendship. You know, it's about being close to people. And how do we do that? And um, I want to ask you guys to think back about your own, if you remember, or your children's. The sort of the, you, there are these always these sort of times when you remember going, wow, they really think, wow, that's how, kids, that's how they're thinking right now. So I'm going to sort of go through these stages and it's by a guy named Robert Selman. This, his work is actually pretty old, but I, I don't want to look around. It seemed to make the most sense to me and in, in sort of sort of more concisely bring all the different pieces together. Um, right, you'll also notice that when I talk about this, there are going to be sort of these these approximate age groups. And they're just, again, the word is approximate. So, you know, it could be doing this early, later, whatever, but it's kind of important to be able to get through this particular piece. The first one is that momentary playmate. So, you know, a friend is someone who is, who's nearby with whom you can have fun. So when the little kids, the three years old, go to the playground, oh, my friend is, you know, come, my friend is over there on the playground. Well, how do you know him? Because we were swinging together. And that's really how they, how they view a friend. And child assumes that everybody thinks like me. And so if, if a kid doesn't have the same opinion, they'll say, well, he doesn't want to be my friend anymore. We're not friends anymore because we don't think the same. Because that's their, their egocentric viewpoint. Um, the next level is approximately four to nine years, and that's one-way assistance. Or friends are people who do nice things for you. Uh, they save you a seat. They tell you you look nice. It's not there's not a, a much of an idea of a two-way street here, but say friends do nice things for you, and that's great. Um, having a friend is really Im more Im important, though, and it's more important to have a friend than to have a, have a good friend. And so I think you know if you, we've seen that with your own children or experiences that you know you know you're, why why is he so mean to you. Why? But he's my friend, you know? And at this point, kids begin to understand a little bit about how th that friendship kind of works. It can be used as leverage, either I will be your friend if you do that, or I will be your friend if you do um, I think in parents, a lot of times we've, we've run into that kind of discussion, having had that kind of discussion with children. And the next set, so, so this is almost like pre-conventional thinking, so these first two stages. It's all about me or maybe what you can do for me, but it's about me. It's not this very, very egocentric. 
In the next stage is we kind of expand our thinking. And it's really more of a two-way street now. Um, I think about this with Kohlberg. This is called the good girl, nice boy stage. You know, um, it's about, you begin to have an understanding about norm. I, this is really more about norms, this first one. Um, it's, you know, it's uh, really thinking about the rules. Remember, particularly in like around fourth grade, kids are really into rules and fairness. And this is, I think, that particular stage. So they can take another person's perspective and they can take their own perspective. They can't just do it at the same time, right? Um, fairness and reciprocity becomes really important, but it's kind of like, if I do something nice for you, you must now do something nice for me. So I saw this, um, I was at last week, I was down with my daughter who has twin boys who just turned around seven. And um, one of them lost their tooth, which you know is a, was a huge issue. The oldest one lost his tooth. I mean, he's the oldest by five minutes, right? Um, but it was really hard for the younger one because you know he didn't. He, he hasn't lost. His, he's only lost one tooth, and he hasn't lost a big tooth like this one. So what 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 one kid did is the older boy actually gave. He had got two dollars, I think, for from the tooth fairy, and he gave one one dollar to his his brother, who really was very pleased. So the brother went and did make his bed for him, which is like. Okay, they got it, but it was like they they sort of fixed that repair they repaired that piece of their relationship by doing this sort of reciprocity thing. But I think if the young one hadn't sort of jumped in to see that he there was a the call on him, things would have not gone gone that well that day for the for the two of them. Um, and it's also really judgmental about themselves at this point, and they they think that you know everybody thinks the same if they think oh my haircut looks really stupid everyone else is going to be thinking that the same same way fitting in becomes really important sort of again this is sort of how to be friends we're all like alike you know we're all similar and if we're not alike it's really a problem okay this is the time for clicks you know this is where the groups about you i'm we have a club and only people who have brown eyes and uh, blonde hair can fit into our, our click kind of thing um the next stage is a much more, more a broader view of this. You know, these are now we have a more mute. Um, there's a sense of mutuality that comes into this in a way that's a, li a little less rigid, a little more uh, seeing this is not a transactional that a friendship goes up beyond being transactional. You know, friends are people who help so you solve problems. You can tell them anything, and they won't tell your secrets. They do nice things for each other without keeping score, and they can compromise. Um, being a best friend is really, really, really important to have a best friend. And that best friend, um, they expect everyone that you, you do everything together and you can't be, you know, if your friend wants to spend time with another person, that's really sort of a betrayal. You know, this, I always think of this as the middle school thing where you can only be friends with certain people. You can't be friends with other people because this is your friend group and that you sort of, it's that sense of, you know, having sort of, you know, we know what a friendship means, but it only can, you know, it, it's lost if it's if it's sort of spread out between more people. Um, fourth is in this more mature friendship, 12 years of adulthood. This is where friends really place a high value in emotional close. Being close, emotionally close is more important to be being physically present, okay? Um, that this is where the friendships or the people are, that you can call you know, you haven't spoken to them in six months and you can call them up and just and tell them something that happened to you and, and they'll be there for you for whatever reason, okay? This is a time where now it's really, um, you can be different. You don't have to be the same. You can, you can even, it's even kind of appreciated and valued that you aren't always the same about things. And I always think about this as the sort of the change, you see this from the change from middle school to high school, you know, that way that which you now in high school, you can be friends with kids in different groups. It's okay. You know, you're not your other friends. Your your best friend is not going to accuse of you of betrayal anymore in a way that wasn't really possible in middle school. Okay. And then, so as you can sort of see, if you, when we sort of work through this, you know, what are some of the skills that are needed really for social development? And the very first one is really self-regulation. That's impulse control, behavior regulation, cognitive flexibility. Um, so, you know, you can't, if your friend does something mean, you don't hit them, you know, that's the very first rule. And, um, you know, to sort of be able to sort of begin to think about how friendship and think about how you feel about people, you really have to be able to control yourself in a way that it's really hard for a four-year-old. But we were expected a seven-year-old to be a little bit better about that, okay? Awareness of others or theory of mind, you know, that not everybody thinks the way that I think, okay? This is a huge, huge developmental 
uh, uh, not burden. It's, 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 you have to get through this. And it, it's a big thing to be able to, this is, it's just, this is, can be very challenging for, for a lot of kids to get through this. Okay. Not everybody thinks the way that I think, All right? Understanding of rules, norms, and conventions, and the part that they play, um, you know, it isn't just to be a nice person. It's because rules help us be safe. Rules help us um, work together. Rules help us, um, you know, accomplish what we want to accomplish. Another is perspective taking. And it's not only that people don't, not everybody, not everybody thinks the way that I think, but let me th start thinking the way that my friend thinks and, and see how that works. And the final thing is mutuality. That's I can appreciate and be, we don't, there's a, this 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 relationship goes both ways, and it doesn't necessarily go go both ways at the same time. But it's a it's a, a mutual kinds of, of thing. So those are that's a lot. That's a lot, and and and, and it doesn't just that's a lot of important uh, milestones that are that are important not only for friendship but other aspects of our life too. Um, so you know, sort of thinking about those, or sort of mean the background of what we're doing. Um, say and i think us also those are some challenges that a lot of our kids have you know they you know beyond being seven and going well what do you mean you don't like pokemon as much as i do well because po pokemon's the most important game you've got to like pokemon you know that becomes more more developed okay um so when we talk about social uh Assessing, making assessment. Let's make a difference between social skills and social competence. So, social skills are specific, discrete behaviors like initiating a conversation, saying no when you don't, you know, when you're uncomfortable with a situation, how to say goodbye, how to transition from one 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 group to another. All right, those are very specific things. But social competence is sort of the general capacity to manage social situations, and it's more like, you know, competence is like you're not necessarily good at everything, but you can manage. A variety of situations. You can manage getting on the bus and meeting your friend. You can manage going into the classroom. You can manage meeting new people. You, you're you're able to sort of handle the have enough kind of skills to, to generally manage what comes down the street. So I think when we talk about assessing assessment, we need to know exactly what's the problem here. You know, where is a kid having difficulty? Now, is it that the kid doesn't know what to do? Is it a skill, a specific skill like a, a social skill? So it's like, how does it? How do you? I, how do I break into a group? How do I initiate a conversation? Okay. Does the child know when to do it? Um, that's both motivation, motivation and context. So, like a kid, a kindergartner may not raise their hand. They may instead blurt out what they want to say. They may kind of know, sort of, that you're supposed to raise their hand, but they don't want to because they really want to tell you about this really cool snake they found. All right. Um, and that's the motivation. And then the context is when, you know, when is it okay to, you know, raising your hand is what you're supposed to do in class. You don't raise your hand when you're in a conversation with your friends. Okay. So when do you do it? And then finally, the, the, the final thing is how good are they at it? The fluency. So someone might know, and then we have a lot of kids like this. We have a lot of our, our kids who are, are on the spectrum who are, they, They've had social skills training. They know what they're supposed to, in, in theory, they know what they're supposed to do. They want to do it. They just aren't very good at it yet, okay? And that's really different from our kid who's really anxious, who may know what to do, but, you know, what's getting in their way is the fact that they're, um, they're, they're having so much doubt about themselves that they don't, what, what are they thinking about me, that they just say, you know, it's easier not to even deal with it, okay? So, um, so I think those are things that are, are really, uh, when we look at what the problem is, we need to decide what exactly is the problem here and how, and before we want to go and try to help kids. Um, okay, so that's, that's sort of my general picture. So what I want to, I think the points that I want to make is that um, each, every kid develops differently and at their own pace in part because of the sort of interweaving with, of, of both sort of the, the built-in roadmap, the individuality of the child, and the context that the child is living in, right? Um, I think the second thing is that we, some of our, we, there is sort of a general pattern and calendar for kids in terms of learning kind of social competence in, uh, in various situations. And then I think the third thing is really just, we got to be much more clear about what exactly the problem is and where it manifests. I think to, to talk about helping our kids. So... 
So I'm open to have questions or the chat or where the, where's the chat? What's that? Oh no, I did the wrong thing. <laughs> um, I'm still, this is a, well, it's two, two years. I'm still learning how to do this stupid Zoom thing. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you can help out a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. That was uh, really great information. Um, and you know, as you were talking, um, I was th thinking about the students that I work with, and and kind of thinking about them in in, in separate groups, um, kind of, of of what they might be facing when it comes to social skills and, and challenges and social competence challenges and. And one of the first ones, um, I, I separated them into three groups, um, diagnosed ASD, um, social anxiety, and then um, third group was um, high levels of depression or no motivation. So that was just kind of the lens that I was looking at this from. And I don't know if there's anything that you could add. Is there anything that I might be missing other than looking at these three different kind of categories of situations that might be going on with a student or a child? Um, I don't know that the, it's different. I think it's just maybe a, a kind of a, a, a another perspective. And this is something that we were talking about earlier. So, so the kids that, you know, kids who feel like they're out of whack, that they're not and that they're not they're not they don't fit in this and I, I want to talk about this really narrow viewpoint of childhood and how you have to get to be a competent child you know it's narrow there's just you know like honestly you know being smart in school being having lots of friends being an athlete you know that kind of covers it and if you don't fit into any of those categories if you don't particularly like school or care about school if um the idea of, of sweating and putting sports is like are you crazy and, and, and you don't have a lot of friends. I mean, that's really tough. It's really tough to get through this period of your life. Um, and so, you know, I think to so the kid who doesn't fit in for a variety, I mean, one, one kid who doesn't fit, often doesn't fit in is the, is the bookworm. You know, the kid who loves, loves, loves to read and may be on the spectrum or may not. They, they just may just may love to read and, and they want to share it with somebody, when, but their vocabulary you know, immediately puts them on the outside of their, their friendship group. And when they talk about ideas, people look at them like they're crazy. And they become, a lot of times those kids become, you know, it's the, it's hard for them to, they don't have a place to engage. You know, there's nobody who's kind of like in their realm. And so what are they going to do? They just sort of pull back. And at that point, great. But you're not out there. If you're not out there practicing your skills, it's like anything else. You don't get to be. You're not very good at it. So now, when you want to be social, you don't have this. You don't have the fluency to be able to do that. That might be a good fluency one, actually. So those that kind of kid can fit into any of those categories, or not in any of those categories at all. You know, I think. You know, I, my guess is that you probably see a lot of kids like that because, for one reason or another, a regular school setting has just been pretty, pretty toxic for them. So, you know, again, you know, if we think about what's the problem with the, the ASD kids, sometimes it's skill acquisition, a lot of times it's skill acquisition. They don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And, and the problem is that until they get motivated, they're really not going to learn. Um, and so what happens a lot of times is, you know, they'll get, they'll go through elementary school and feel perfectly fine about not really having a connection. Then all of a sudden someplace in middle school and high school, they wake up and they go, wait a minute, I want to have friends. I, I want... You know, it's it's hardwired that we want to have friends. They just don't know how to do it now, and so I think that's that's sort of an issue. I think our kids with social anxiety, a lot of times those kids are um, they're having problems with interpreting social cues, but in a, for a different re reason. I think they're sort of they've got this this uh, response bias, this negative response bias, because they're afraid of that everybody's thinking that they're as stupid as they're afraid they are. And so they're, everything that's, that they are, um, every, every kind of, and especially any kind of ambiguous response or unexpected response is, uh, is received as a, a threat. And so they're gonna then pull back, which is, was different from the ISD kid who may or may not get it, um, you know. And they may also be feeling anxious, but that's sort of secondary to the fact that they didn't get it in the first place. 
And then I think that the, the one that's really tough is a depressed and no motivation kid, because that kid, you have to find a hook somewhere. And finding a hook for those kids is really, really difficult, um, I think, um, because a lot of the places where that, that they feel the safest and most comfortable are not necessarily social social situations. It's like, it's like video games, it's like gaming and stuff like that, or reading a book or doing whatever, where they're, um, they're not going to be asked to do anything they either don't want to do or don't feel like they can do. Um, I think those kids are... Um, I'm trying to think what are the, what are these piles that I would put those kids in? I think that's just it's a it's those kids really just have to find what the hook is. What is a little bit of passion that they have and seeing if you can engage them on that. And so maybe it's like, you know, I, I remember a, a a father who this kid was both depressed and on the spectrum, and they went to um the, the comic store and they, every Saturday the comics store had a had a I don't know if it was Pokemon they had some kind of you know card thing that the kids would do and it was the one thing the kid liked to do and it also got him and dad was able to get him out in the in the, in the community to actually do it and when he got him out he actually had to like look people in the eye and talk to them a little bit and it was a you know it was really key for them to sort of get through that part of his life you know i think um for a lot of kids it's art um you know uh, I think in the anime stuff, that was a, that, that's a crazy, I think it's still going on. And that for a lot of those kids, that's the one place they just felt okay. And to be with other kids who did that, understand, understood mangas and those kinds of things was really, really important. You know, I think even, even some of the, you know, the, um, I'm going to make it sound really stupid, but you know, some of the, 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 the multi, um, multi-gaming kind of multi-partner gaming kinds of things but sort of being able to translate those little pieces into something that's a little bit more in the real world so that these kids can feel a little less endangered if they put their head up and say something about anything i think it's okay right. Right. um so a couple questions in the chat that i'd uh, like to relay to you um first one is it true that kids who are intellectually high level are lower are lower level in social social emotional development? It can be true. That can be very true. It's like it's like I'll give you an example. So um, at one point I was doing I did was doing a lot of stuff. I was I was I, did, I was doing a lot of stuff around um, social emotional development in, in schools and and doing some. And I was asked to substitute teach for a class and they were, the class was talking about oh, what were they talking? commitment. And um, the, it was interesting because this was at Lexington high school and, and, the, and this was a, and these, this was a health class and the class was a mixed group of kids. Okay. So there were really smart kids. There were, were kids who were, who were in the language based classroom. There were kids who were athletes or whatever. And these were kids who didn't necessarily ever, their past didn't necessarily cross all that well. Um, and so, and what was just so interesting to me, so we were talking about commitment and this big Husky football player starts talking about what commitment meant. Commitment meant when I commit to my team and my teammates, I'm there for them, even when I don't feel like it, even when it's really, I don't like the kid or I, I don't know what's going on, but I committed to them and I committed, we're together, we work together. And that's what commitment really means. And so as, as he's talking about this, I'm looking down at the other end of the aisle and there are these two girls who are obviously in all the AP classes and they're tying, they're painting each other's fingernails and they're tying their shoelaces together. Because for them, they're so like, they were just so blown away about being in this, having to be in this health class with a football player. And they didn't, it wasn't, it, they hadn't even gotten to that place in their relationships yet. They were, they were so, the emphasis had been so developed on their de cognitive development. They didn't really know. They were back with the little kids, you know, and it was like, I was just so blown away that they couldn't, and they didn't get it. They didn't get what this guy was talking about. And they were just filling around the back of the classroom. So that was, a, that's sort of an example. I think what happens, you know, it's like for and, and kids who are, who are good athletes, you know, who are, or one of those, you know, we got those, those kids who are incredible athletes and that's, they're sort of developed in that area. What, what gets fall behind academics and social skills, you know, those things. And those kids, they end up at the at high school and maybe their dream worked out and maybe it didn't, but what do they have left? Well, they're not, you know, they got some, it's, it's a real issue for them then because they haven't been, their, their development has been so distorted. So, so I think, I think it's particularly important for bright kids 
and it's hard for them because they're so they're so they're so used to sort of getting things effortlessly and this may not be this may they may need to need to really work on this one and they're not used to working like that so great thank you um is there sorry um how can we help with the kids who have experienced rejection and now they're at the point of school refusal right and so here we go back to what you're talking about all the social anxiety the depression the, the um, sort of not fitting in that they've been rejected for for whatever reason i think that one's really um again you guys in some ways are sort of set up really nicely for that because i think the one-to-one -one connection that you have with the teachers to have that right kind of connection is really a way of, of drawing a kid in and then once i mean you know that's that's sort of that may be a hook for them you know i think this is the kid who, who i was talking to about sort of that the negative um the, the negative bias to any kind of unexpected and undesirable behavior you know there are so at this point they're so at, they're kind of wired to protect themselves and so there any kind of danger is going to have them sort of resort to their you know fight fight or, or freeze kinds of of strategies basically that are kind of automatic and whatever what you know there's a lot of flight with with these kids into, into social withdrawal i think again um the two things i talk about with with, um, with anxious kids is you know you've got to do um help them reduce their anxiety but you've also got to teach them a skill you know because because being anxious is feeling threatened helpless in a situation where you have no control all right and you don't feel safe so if you can help them feel safe and you can teach them a skill that's really important safety comes up from relationships so they, they feel like they're in a place where a teacher or someone understands them that that can be sort of their bridge to sort of getting out there and teaching them skills like how to start a conversation you know what are some and maybe they don't need it in the same way that a kid on the spectrum needs but you know what are some good conversation starters you know working on okay you know did you know that so and so also likes minecraft you know uh, or that so and so has been in this you know that we have this this club you know and it's it's for doing for doing anime stuff are you interested in you know, why don't you? I'll, I'll, why don't we? Go, you come with me. We'll we'll come to a, we'll a meeting one time. That kind of sort of bridging can really help, and the and the skill development. So once you get to the club, what are you gonna? You know, what happens if someone? You know, if you someone's talking about something you're really interested in, what are you gonna do? How, how are you gonna say that? What could you say? You know, and sort of teaching them in that kind of context. But again, it's the feeling safe, teaching a skill that are really important. Do you have any strategies um, for kids who monologue about their special interest? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of how to, I think some of this is sort of teaching a kid some self-awareness. Um, you know, the first thing is that, did you know, you know, sort of, this is sort of some of the skill acquisition stuff. Did you notice that when you were talking about plumbing supplies that um, so-and-so was looking at his watch? What, what do you think? Why, why do you think he did that? Oh, maybe because he wasn't really interested in the plumbing supply stuff. And so, again, this is sort of the, 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 this is when, you know, if you say that to a kid in the, who's not who doesn't really care about friends yet, it's not really going to say so what? But I want to talk about it. this is what I want to talk about. But if you get a kid who says, you know, I want to have friends now, you go, this is a place to say, well, you know, sometimes you know, it's good to, oh, you know, people don't always have the same interests and it's good to talk about what their interests are. Or maybe the first thing is you limit, you know, you, you, there are ways you can do this and there are other apps on your phone, but you can even do it with your phone like that I can only talk about such things for two minutes, my alarm will go off and then I have to, I have to talk about something else. I mean, sometimes it's these very, 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 you know, concrete kind of things, but they can really be helpful. This is, that's also really good for your impulsive kid the ADHD impulsive kid who wants bright kid who wants to talk a lot, but sometimes they kind of take over the whole class. You know, sometimes doing things like having them, if there are six kids in a class, keep track of and it's developing self awareness. Keep track of how many times they've talked and let three other kids talk before they raise their hand again. I mean, very concrete kinds of things like this can be really helpful because you know it's it's it's, it's it helps them develop some self awareness, and that's often sort of difficult. 
and it, that is um, uh, feel free anyone who has any any further questions please put them in the chat I have one that I'm going to ask if that's okay with everyone. Um, I was um, interested in the um, awareness of others component of your presentation and I was wondering. Is there anything kind of off the top of your head that might be kind of useful to to help with awareness of others for our children and students. Well, one of the things I think is really, 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 really helpful is our TV shows and movies, um, because what they're great for a lot of different reasons. One is the reason is that you can slow it down, you can go over it, you can like repeat it over and over again. But you know, to have a to to watch a show with a kid and go, why do you think he said that? Or what was it? Why would he? Why would he do something like that to somebody? Or wow. That's what's that? What do you think that expression is about? Those kinds of sort of stopping a kid and sort of thinking about it, you know, what's really going on there? Um, I think can be really, really useful. Um, I think um, and because you can, I think when I talk to kids who who have these kind of challenges, one of the problems with them is that it's their their it's that they the processing is slow. If you slow it down enough, a lot of times they can at least intellectually get it. But the thing, the thing about social interactions is they're so quick and they're so complex that a lot of kids really get lost. Maybe they can keep up with one, can't keep up with two, or maybe two, but can't keep up with three. And that sort of awareness kind of, that's the first thing that goes out the window is that, you know, it's like, I really want to talk about the, you know, what happened at Terrytown in the Revolutionary War and why won't they get on it rather than, well, someone else is interested in something else, you know, kind of stuff. Um, I'm big on concrete things. I think that's really helpful. Um, so, you know, uh, role playing can, can be good too, you know, sort of having kids sort of guess what's going on in someone else's head <clears throat> or try out different responses uh, with kids, so. Awesome. Thank you. Um, how can we help the child that is um, when they're withdrawn and shut down and they're not connecting? Um, I think you have to respect that. I think it depends. So are you talking about a kid who's always terminally shut down or a kid who, for, who has, for some reason, has now pulled in and is just not responding at all if the person who asked that question can can put that in the chat if it's um just kind of a one-off thing or if they're kind of baseline i wouldn't say no my i talk about you know i always talk about with anxiety fight fight and freeze you know fight is the in those are the when our, when our anxiety gets high enough and we feel we're now thrown into threat alert and survival those are our reflexive responses and we all do them some of them, you know, but we I tend to have a, pre, a pre, preferred style. So fight is the kid who says, I don't want it. You can't make me. It's a stupid thing. I'm not going to talk about it. You know, but who wants to talk about the revolutionary war is stupid. Um, the, the, the flight kid is the kid who goes, who, who spaces out, is distracted. Oh, oh, um, I just think, I think I tore my finger. You know, can I go down to the nurse's office or I've got to get my, into my cubby because I really need to get my pen. You know, they, they're trying to get out of it. And the freeze kid is a kid who shuts down. They can't get started and they can't stop. And those are the kids who often put their heads on their desk and the teacher says they're being non-compliant or they won't involve. I think it's really important to realize that's a sign of a kid feeling overwhelmed and threatened. And we need to be respectful of that. You know, we need to understand that and just say, okay, you know, so-and-so, you know what? You, you just look like you really need to take a break. You want to take a little break now? You know, just sort of offering them a way of, if they're, if they're feeling unsafe and they don't know what to do. And so now they're, and now they're overwhelmed and put their hand down. How to help them sort of get through, don't talk. Talking doesn't help. You know, just sort of helping them feel safe. Does it mean suggesting that they want to listen to their headphones for a little bit or um, go take a walk or just help them. Don't talk to them so much as help them sort of do something that makes them feel better, all right? And once they feel better, then you can say, you know, in, uh, when we were in, um, in the history class, you just, uh, there was a time you just put your head down and you just couldn't even really talk. And it looked like you were pretty overwhelmed. What was going on right there? Um, I think it's always surprising to me. And I think it was one of my biggest faults as a parent was I didn't ask enough questions. I just assumed I knew what was going on with a kid. And a lot of times 
when you ask the question, so what's up with that? Well, what, what happened back there? Sometimes you'll, a lot of times you'll get, well, I don't know. But sometimes you'll go get it. Well, it, it wasn't what you thought it was, you know? It wasn't that he really felt that the kids were laughing at him because he asked a dumb question. It was because, you know, he remembered that he forgot to bring his lunch and he was really upset. I mean, you know, there was a lot of it, but just even to, to find out a little bit more and not at the moment, help at the moment, help them feel more safe and then let her get back to it. But respect that what you're seeing is a kid who's overwhelmed. Okay. Um, again, the, when things are good, you might say, well, you know, there's a, you, maybe what, what you could do at that point is you could give me a signal that you just need to be left alone for a minute. So maybe you could like, I don't know, raise your hand or, you know, put a yellow card up, you know, you can even put, you can, some kids I've used, they've used cards, you know, if I put a yellow card on my desk. It means I'm just, I just need to take a break right now or whatever, but, um, that kind of thing. Those kind of kids are, are tough. It's a lot easier to deal with a fight kid, I think. Um, but the kids who freeze is, is really tough. And I think the, but the place to start is to, to respect it, what it is. Um, how about the kid who doesn't seem interested in, in playing with friends at all? And then impulsively asked to get together with someone, you know, that afternoon. Yeah, that's a toughie. Okay. I think this also comes back to what I was talking about, the, the, the stages of friendship too. What is this kid expecting? What is, how is this, what's his view of friendship at this point? Is friendship just someone who, uh, well, I have a new Pokemon game, maybe he'll come and play with me, you know, or he's got one and I want him to play, want to play with him, or is it more of a two-way street, or, you know, what is, what is his view of, uh, well, you know, it's the afternoon, and, and he might be doing something else right now, did you, I wonder what, why, you know, what do you think he, he'll do if you call, um, just sort of helping him sort of think through how that's going to work, have you ever talked to him before, you know, does he know, your, you know, does he, does he know you, you know, have you guys hung out on the playground together, um, sort of working through what a friend is and how that works. Sort of maybe suggesting, well, maybe not, you know, calling up, why don't you, let's make a plan about how you could like hang out with him on the playground tomorrow or something. Or, you know, approach him during study hall. But again, try to, what is this kid's theory of friendship and why is, what is he thinking is going to happen if he does this? Um, one of the other things about <clears throat> development that we used to talk about is kids will understand if you're one step above them, um, but they won't um, they won't get two steps. So if you have a kid who's who's sort of sees this as a transactional kind of thing, a friend is someone who does something nice for me, they can understand, they can get the concept of yeah, but then you want if you know if you wanted to do something nice for you, you have to do something nice for them. They can get that, but they can't get this idea of, well, you know, everybody's different and you have to respect everybody in a different way. Yeah, but no, friends do something nice for me. I mean, they, it, so you have to sort of hit their, your reasoning and your logic has to come closer to theirs and maybe to push them just a little higher than they are right now, but not too high. And, and in the same situation, um, the 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 son wants the mom to be the one to reach out and text the boy's mother and how old is the child because that's that's totally appropriate for a seven-year-old eight. okay eight uh, that's that's a, that might be a good place for a, a lesson which is sure, I'll do that, but let's talk about how you could do that, you know? Um, so, so this is how I do it. I call up and I say, hi, so-and-so, you know, um, uh, the, what, so-and-so wants to get together with your son, is that possible? So what could you say? How, if you were gonna do that, how could you do that? Maybe you could, maybe you could call them up and say, hey, so-and-so, do you wanna come over and play Minecraft, you know? Um, but again, use it as a teaching, accept it, but use it as a teaching moment to sort of push them a, not too far, but just a little bit farther. Yeah. And teach skills. Stephanie, I want to return for a second to um, 
the student ha- that was withdrawn or shut down. Um, when the people that are caring for them, you know, parents, um, you know, psychiatrists um, are, are really struggling to get through to them. Um, what's the next step? Because I, I can imagine that this is a very um, challenging situation where the student won't open up at, at all. Uh, yeah. Any suggestions? Um, I think that becomes a conversation too, you know, about um, how to involve your team. I think one of the things that I would want to do with a kid like that is to have, again, sit down with the kid and say, look, under, you know, I noticed that you don't want to come out of your room. Um, and even for dinner, you really won't want to come out of your room. And that makes me kind of worried because I'm, I'm worried about you and I love you. And I, I don't think, and I worry what, that you're, you're not, that's something that you're feeling really bad. So what's up with that? You know, you know, again, this sort of, I'm, I'm doing this with cloud or problem solving kind of model stuff, but you know, sort of reach out to the kid and say, you're trying to again, find out what, what's going on. I, I probably won't say much. And then, but you've started and you open it up and you said, I want to know about what you think. Do you want to, you could write me, you can email me, you could write me an email, you could text me, you know, if uh, um, talking doesn't work and for a lot of kids talking doesn't work, there's other ways of doing that. Um, but here's the thing, um, I'm really worried about you and I'm really concerned. So, you know, sort of set some parameters about how, how much time a kid can spend in their room when the computer's going to get shut off. And those are kinds of things you have to, that's a, the kind of thing that you sort of work out with the psychiatrist and the therapist and the, and the school together, I think, but the, to sort of set a, a, to so both sort of respecting the kid, but also insisting that there's some structure here and that he has to go to school. He has to come down for meals, you know, has to take a shower, those kinds of things. Um, and that's, that can be really tricky. Um, but, you know, and sometimes it means, earning access to things that are important, um, like, you know, computers and laptops and video games and things like that. Um, I think it is really important, though, not to let that go on too long. Um, because the longer it goes on, the really harder it is to, to, um, to break it. Yeah. And, and, in the follow-up for this webinar, um, I'll include my contact information and um, Nesca's and, and, and information as well if, if this parent wants to reach out to me. Um, yeah. So, Steph, I think... That's not, it's, you know, it's on one hand, it's not an uncommon problem, and also it's a really difficult problem. Um, and I think one of the other things that I think can be really helpful is if a kid won't get help, then the person who's hurting the most should get help, and that could be the parent. And to get to be involved in a support group is re, can be really, really helpful because you know what? There are other people who, I mean, sometimes if you try to talk to your friends in this kind of situation, they look at you like, oh, well, why don't you just, ins, you know, insist that they do X, Y, and Z? Well, you know, you did that six years ago or six months ago. That doesn't help. But to know someone else who's also going through the same thing and they may know more about it. They may be in a different place than you. They may have gone a little bit further. They know what, kind of what works, what doesn't work, but they can at least support you and being the kind of and, and and helping you support your kid and and that's you know it's I, I call it money in the bank it's like if you're as a parent if you don't put money in the bank you don't and the kid you know emotionally that when your kid really needs you and is open to you, you don't have it to give um, if you're not taking care of yourself mm-hmm. so I, I really strongly encourage parents to be involved with support groups or therapists or any kind of helping kind of process because this isn't easy um, here's another one. Um, do kids feel pressure? Um, actually, let me do this one first because it might be a quick one. Do you know about any support groups for siblings of kids with special needs, um, i.e. Uh, autism or ADHD? Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure that AANE runs support groups for siblings. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they do. I think they have, I have a, put something out recently about that. And then, um, there are also for kids who have who have um, siblings with significant mental health challenges. I think that's another group of kids who are often pretty traumatized. 
um, by what their what their family and their their sibling has gone through. Um, and there are, I I'm trying to remember where I saw that. I'd have to think about that. I'll have to go back and check with my colleagues about that. But I think there are there are some groups for for those kids, and that's really important. I think. Yeah, I, I placed the link for um, AANE in the chat yeah. if someone wants to find that. Um, it, this series of questions, it, it, I feel, is a pretty good one to round everything out. Um, do kids feel pressure from parents to be more social? Um, and do we need to allow them to learn the social skills at their own pace? Are there late bloomers um, or should there be interventions? And how do we tell when it's time to intervene? So this is why I wanted to talk about the fact that there's a lot of different ways of being social and that we have, we have again, a very, I think we conventionally have a very narrow viewpoint that a person, a socially competent person, a person who has lots of friends, who goes out all the time, who, you know, gets together with them and does all these cool kind of things. That's great. And there are people who do that, but that's not, the, that's not necessarily social competence. And that's not necessarily what we need. Look, my feeling is, a kid needs a friend. Now, some kids just need one friend. It's probably better to have two. But, you know, after that, it's really up to the kid. So I think, I think, I think we can, as parents, put a lot of pressure on our kids to be more social and to be more like, I don't know, the equivalent of cheerleaders or something. I'm trying to think of what the, what the stereotype, the best stereotype would be. But that's not, no, that's not necessarily the way it has to be. It's just, you know, can they can they manage social situations and do they have someone with whom they feel close? That's the, the, the two really most important things. Now, you know, it's really interesting. Um, if you, if you have, if you are involved in the autism world at all, you see, um, T Temple Grandin, who is a, who's a wonderful, wonderful writer about, she's, she has autism and she's has pretty significant autism. And uh, she's also a uh, world renowned specialist in animal and animal care. Um, and she, and in part, she talks a lot about why she's so good at it. It's because she's so, she's so bad at things like making inferences and, you know, and understanding how other people think. But she can she can look at like a, a cattle processing plant and understand what's spooking the cow um, because she's a very concrete thinker in that way. She's she is a very, very compelling speaker. She's very interesting. She's very funny. She's very um, she's one. She's really it's fun to watch her. And she's also very, and she has a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, significant social challenges, but she can do it. You know, when she gets home, I don't know what she does to, so to relieve the, the stress of it, but she can manage the situation. And that's kind of the things, you know, just, do you have to do it all the time? No. Can you manage the social demands in your lifestyle? That's kind of important. So. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, thank you again for this webinar and um, thank you everyone who has joined. Um, I'm going to be sending out the recording. Um, and actually one second, let me just, I want to make sure everyone hears this in the chat. Uh, CTDS also runs sibling support groups for- Oh, good, good, yeah. Um, Emily, Emily Rubin at Mass Sibling Support Network runs virtual sibling support groups at uh, U UMass uh, Worcester, uh, the Cambridge Health Alliance and Children's Hospital. Um, NAMI, NAMI is another resource. Um, I'll be sure to, to put all of this stuff as well as the recording in the slides in the follow up email. So um, you can be looking for, for all of that. Um, so thank you again, everyone. Uh, I'm glad everyone was able to make it. Thanks, guys. That was great. I'm multitasking. This is one of our students, John. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll uh, we'll definitely be following up with you. That was great. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Hey, Matt. Stephanie, that's my uh, head of school for the Hingham campus. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, good. It's, it's interesting. I, I'd, I'd be interested in feedback because I, this is the first time I've done this thing, this kind of model, and I'd love to, you know, if anyone gives me any feedback, I'd, I'd appreciate it. So. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I, I definitely um, I thought it went great. I, I mean, I thought it went well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, it's tough with an hour on like we had talked about this with such an expansive subject to I know. figure out. All right, what's gonna be in the presentation part? But I, I, I think it went well, and I think having that uh, a lot of time at the end for Q and A, yeah. I think that went well for that yeah i think so too because i think and the questions are the right questions to 